Acunetics helps thousands of organizations secure their websites and web applications across the globe. Whether you're a one-person team ensuring the security of a few websites or a large organization interested in automating your web vulnerability assessment and management, Acunetics is here to help. Thanks all for joining in. My name is Matthias Madou. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Secure Code Warrior. Um, and today I would like to talk for, uh, about AppSec is dead, long live DevSecOps. A little bit of a history about myself. My name is Matthias Madou. Um, I started my career at Ghent University in Belgium where I pursued a PhD in application security. Um, with my PhD, I actually moved to the US and I joined an at that time small company called Fortify. Um, Fortify, was a company that was doing really, really good at finding problems in code. And I've spent seven years all together, and I think we did a really good job. Um, ultimately, what made me jump is I thought at the end of the, of the seventh year, I actually realized that it wasn't all too hard to find problems in code if you never tell a developer how to write secure code in the first place. So with that knowledge, we actually started Secure Code Warrior and our vision, our mission, what we really would like to achieve is um, if you're an organization and you want to write Secure Code from the start, you should think about Secure Code Warrior because Secure Code Warrior can provide you with the tools and the training and the help that you need to write Secure Code from the start. So. What would I like to talk about today? So first of all, I would like to figure out like, hey, why on earth are we still talking about writing secure code? Um, isn't that problem already solved, you know? Um, and what is the security person actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis? So if this is not solved, like um, how are we tracking towards solving this particular problem of writing secure code? Then I would like to dive into um, something that I found, which is like called CALMS, um, Culture Automation Measurement and Sharing, which fits really, really nicely with DevOps. But I was wondering like, hey, how can we fit security in there? How can we fit security into the culture, into the automation, into the measurement, into the sharing, into this new way of working? And ultimately, I would like to come to a conclusion. Um, and I don't think there's time for Q&A or that we don't do Q&A today. Um, why are we still talking about the impossibility of writing secure code? Well, um, actually, first of all, I tried to figure out what is one of the most expensive coding errors that happened in recent history. Um, and it, I came uh, to, to the Ariana 5 rocket. Um, with the Ariana 5 rocket, within a minute after the launch, they had to detonate or self-detonate um, the rocket. Um, with that, $7 billion was lost, $7 billion. Um, but even spending $7 billion would not bring the rocket back. You know, it took 10 years of work to actually produce and construct this particular rocket. And what happened was actually a very small, tiny coding mistake, um, where for velocity, it was um, a 64-bit float. They actually, at some point in time, tried to convert that into a 16-bit integer. Of course, an overflow happened, but if you would have proper error handling, um, you can actually get away with that. But for performance reasons, they actually suppressed the error handling, which led you know, to instead of the rocket going, rocket going up, the rocket suddenly wanted to go backwards and they had to self-detonate the rocket a good 30 seconds into the launch. Well, imagine being the developer that had written the code on the left-hand side or that had commented out um, the actual, the actual um, error handling method. Um, small coding mistake, big financial um, loss, but NASA actually learned its lesson. What NASA said is like, well, let's, let's learn from this mistake. You know, it, it looks like a tiny, on paper, this looks like a tiny mistake just um, not having that, that um, error handling routine over there, but it had big, big consequences. And what NASA did was actually very smart. They said, hey, you know what? How about we invest into um, checking and double checking and triple checking or code that goes into a rocket so that ultimately we do not have such a huge loss. So let's um, spend a little bit more beforehand so that we don't you know, have to have that gigantic loss. So what NASA did, they upped it um, they're, they're spending on lines of code. And over here, you can see that NASA spent around $1,000 per line of code in 2001, 
where the average of um, other code that was written um, during 2001 was roughly $50. And, and, you know, it actually worked out because something like that did not happen. Sorry. Um, today, you would say, well, that's an old coding mistake. You know, that was old code. Um, today, there's, there's new stuff. You know, there's um, uh, more interesting problems like SQL injection, the feature where you can actually read everything from the database. You can update any piece of data in the database. You can remove data from the database. Um, you can display data from the database. An interesting feature called SQL injection. It's not a feature, of course. Um, it is one of the major problems and where, where you would think that this is a new thing. Well, when we were decorating our office, our Secure Code Warrior office, I actually uh, put this particular frame on the wall and it's an XKCD about SQL injection. I actually assigned one that I received from my manager back in the day at Fortify. And that was signed, hey, um, Merry Christmas, Matthias, um, from Jacob 2008. This is 12 years ago. Um, so. We're, we're talking about SQL injection for the last 12 years. And even in 2008, that was not a new thing. In 2008, that was already 10 years old. Um, so you may ask yourself, well, is this going to be another talk about SQL injection? No, this is not going to be another talk about SQL injection. This is just to illustrate how far back we have to go since that problem was discovered. And here we are, 2020, we're still talking about that problem. So is that still a problem? Well, it seems like it is, you know, because there's data. And as Jim Barksdale, former CEO of Netscape said, like, hey, if we have data, let's look at the data. If we have opinions, let's go with mine. So luckily for um, everybody watching this video, we have some data, so you don't have to go with my opinions. Um, first of all, one out of three newly scanned applications has SQL injection. Uh, the joke goes that two out of three do not have a database. Every year we write 111 billion lines of code. We are all software developers and creators. You know, where, where is the software deleter in our organization? Nobody has the title of being the software deleter. We only want to have more, bigger, um, fancier features. Um, that's what our customers request. So we want to do more, more, more. Um, it is 30 times more expensive to fix a problem at the end of the cycle than all the way in the beginning. Okay, the joke goes that um, because of that, we only fix one out of 30 problems that land our bug tracking system. And the average global cost of a security breach is, yes, almost 4 million. So why are we still talking about SQL injection? And let me give you a very simple example. I think pretty much the only code example um, in my talk here of why we are still talking about SQL injection. Well, we have this query, it's concatenation. We have four parameters. And if your pen testers come back and they scream and say, oh my God, parameter one and parameter two are vulnerable to SQL injection. Well, then instantly we go to the developers and they actually have to fix parameter one and parameter two because there's um, immediate danger we are exposed. If parameter three, you know, our static analysis solution comes back and says, you know what, if all the stars align, and if something really funky and tricky happened, well, then potentially maybe this particular path in our application gets executed, and that will be a SQL injection. At that point in time, what quite often happens in organizations is that they start a fight between security developers and QA to figure out if this is really, really a problem. And if this is really, really, really a problem, then, well, one day the developers are going to fix that. Um, quite often, you know, just fixing it is, is way less work than starting this particular fight in organizations. Last but not least, if parameter four, if none of our um, white hat hackers, if none of our tools come back and say, you know what, parameter four is a problem, well, we are not going to fix parameter four because you know why? It's, it's not a problem. You know, it, our application works. Nobody is telling that this is a problem. So don't touch it. Um, everything works fine, do not touch the code. Well, if, um, first of all, our tools, you know, may have made a mistake and it may be a problem, but even if it's not a problem today, if tomorrow a new developer comes on board and something called a copy paste problem, problem, if he copies this piece of code and he pastes it somewhere else and he's using it in another context, it may be a problem. Um, or if a developer creates a new path in the application, it may become a problem. 
And that is exactly why we're still talking about sequel injection 22 years after it was discovered, because there is no holistic approach on how to tackle sequel injection today, and especially not in our old applications. Let's put it in a different perspective from a company. There are security issues. Um, if you look at your bug tracking system, I've never seen an empty bug tracking system. There are always bugs in the bug tracking system. And yes, some of them are security problems. And we ask a developer, can you fix the security problems? We give him, well, nothing. We don't give him any help. You know, just fix the code, please. Um, and we ask him to fix the, the security issues with very little help. Why, why is that? Because, well, first of all, the scale of your AppSec team is very, very small. Um, data says that on average, there's one person per 100 developers. Yes, some studies say it's almost two, but these studies include only organizations that already think about um, writing secure code. There are so many organizations that, that where it's not even on the roadmap. So uh, there's, and imagine 100 people. You are the one person that on a day-to-day -day basis has to make sure that the code being written by 100 productive developers is secure. Imagine that. Do you know 100 people? Have you spoken to 100 people in the last month? Um, that is just, it's impossible. Um, on top of that, developers and security, you know what? They kind of speak a different language, right? Um, developers, you know, they, they talk about technology stacks, they talk about code, they talk about features and how good they are. Um, and, and they just want to make sure that what they need to produce for um, the product manager is actually delivered. If we talk about um, security, well, um, all they need to do is find, you know, one problem in the code and, and they just say, hey, you know what, there's one problem and we're going to call your baby ugly because, you know, it, it falls apart. Um, they also tell you what the problem is and quite often they will not tell you what the solution is because quite often they're, well, not really deep into that technology and they only know how to break the system but not really build the system. There's a ton of overhead. So even if you need to fix a particular issue, it takes a lot of steps before getting that actually resolved. Remember the 30 times more expensive? Well, this comes into play here where um, every problem that is fixed by the developer, he needs to find the fix, implement the fix, and so on and so forth. So that's the first problem. So ultimately, yes, he fixes a couple of problems like the OWASP top one, maybe top three. It's going to be hard to fix the OWASP top 10. But that's what we claim that we do. On top of that, as I said, we create more features. Um, we create more code, which introduces more problems. There's actually scanning solutions that find 700 different categories of problems. 700. So it's nearly impossible for a developer to not make a mistake. And last but not least, there are these problems that are unfound or um, not discovered yet. And I intentionally use the infinity loop over here because that is the never ending story that we would like to break. So this infinity loop, we would love to break. So software, um, and, uh, software security person today, what is he doing and what is he supposed to be doing? Well, today um, he is supposed to think about um, really the hard questions, the tough questions on, hey, how can I steer all these developers in an organization in writing secure code. He should be thinking about that. As I've said before, you know, there's only one person per 100 developers that is really doing this, that is really thinking about application security. So quite often they are just dragged into other things like finding the same problem over and over and over again and not being able to break that infinite loop and figure out like, hey, how can we for once and for all solve this particular problem? He's trying to build a team um, he's trying to deliver um, uh, the, 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 the security stamp on time. Um, he's trying to make the deadlines. That is everything that he's doing um, while he should be thinking about producing secure code. One thing that is good about application security is quite often it is not a budgeting problem. There is money to be spent because security is in a lot of organizations very, very important. And as my good friend Notorious B.I.G. would say, more money is more problems. And that actually perfectly relates to what we're doing today in code because we're producing more and more and more code. And we're actually producing more vulnerabilities. And why is that? 
And what is the biggest, I think, secret that we need to um, work on today is the fact that um, I think the way we can get out of this cycle is really making sure that there's cross-pollination between developers and security. Developers should more and more understand how to produce secure code, but at the same time, at the same time, the security people really have to start understanding the code. Quite often, it is sufficient for a security person to just break it, give it back to developers, and then say, fix it. Um, and I, I don't think, you know, if you're still a person today that does not understand code and in your application security or software security, software security, well, unfortunately, you know, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna be your job in the next five years because the security people will have to understand code. They will have to sit down with developers. They will have to help the developers in producing um, a, a secure solution, a secure end product. All right, how can we create secure code today? Um, first of all, there's a lot of methodologies out there. We um, or a lot of people think we have moved on from waterfall and we're all doing agile and we're moving into devops i'm not quite sure if that's true quite often i see uh, a waterfall which is still you know it's still actually a waterfall but we're trying to hide that and and we call it agile but if we go back to to the root of what we're doing we're doing a waterfall mechanism anyway there's companies that moved on from waterfall they're doing really good agile um, where they work and, and split up the work into shorter cycles where there where there's more rapid feedback cycles from the customers that are using the software and they actually produce um, a solution that is closer to what a developer uh, to to what the end customer or a group of customers wants to see and yes even some of the organizations has really moved on from agile and are more working the devops way um, where the developer, the way I see it, is the developer um, gets more um, authority. He gets he gets more responsibility of what he's doing because what he's producing is also going to be rapidly put into production. That he's going to be responsible for that code, so he has to make sure there's it's adequately tested, and it's also going to be adequately tested moving forward if other people produce code. So, I think security has to adopt, adopt over here. We cannot say, well, um, from a security perspective, we live in waterfall model, and this is going to be the thing that you need to do. Um, no, I think um, if this is the way that we produce code, security has to move on too, and has to adapt and figure out how we can work in these new methodologies. Um, and, and that's quite often misunderstood where security is, nope, this is the way we have to do it, even though you guys have moved on. So how can we move on? There's a couple of ways. So first of all, we can ask the developers um, to work harder and faster um, and do more. Um, guess what? Uh, developers will not be happy about that because they already have a job, you know, and that is producing features. Um, in, in their job title, it doesn't say secure and security. And what developers will claim is, hey, you know what? There are people in this organization that are responsible for security because it's in their name. It's in their uh, uh, job title. So um, we have to make sure that from a security perspective, we reach the developers, we help the developers, um, and we really have to make sure that we can communicate with them and that they are producing secure code. So it's not by asking developers to work harder um, and, and faster. No, we have really have to work smarter. So how can we work smarter? Well, I think we can work smarter um, by integrating with the tools that they are using on a day-to-day -day basis. So a developer is, is already working in a number of tools today, like in Slack, like in GitHub, like in Jira, he's working in IDE. So he's already working in, in these tools. Um, I think there's an opportunity for security to be there in these tools, to integrate with these tools and be there at the tip of their fingers when they actually need it. So um, if they are discussing in Slack um, a particular 
security vulnerability or a security problem, well, it would be good if out of the blue, they get some help what that particular problem is and how they can solve that problem. Or if they are typing in their IDE that something pops up and, and guides him and helps him in producing secure code. Or if they have a problem in the bug tracking system being filed, a security vulnerability in the bug tracking system, that when they go there, they automatically get a relevant training module in the language and framework that they are using, and they, they can instantly actually eradicate that problem. So I really think there's um, an opportunity for application security today to move on from the waterfall way of working to be more nimble and be more um, in the tools and give rapid feedback to the developers when they actually need it. So we should not distract them or disturb them with their work. No, we should be there. We should be smart and we should pop up when they need us. Um, some people will say, yes, we can actually um, extend um, the, the whole, the, 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 the infinity loop of, of DevOps and say, you know, there's also a place for training and assessing where, um, you know, if we do something, if we um, uh, go through the different stages um, with new technologies, you know, there's, there's constantly um, new technologies being pushed into organizations. Well, it is really hard for developers to keep up with that. Um, we're convinced that in the new way of working in these um, uh, rapid um, uh, development cycles, there's also a place for training and actually learning about new technologies and, and doing that in a secure way um, so that we're actually using the latest and greatest, which is the best fit for what we're trying to achieve today. So then I was actually trying to figure out um, how can we be successful with DevOps? And I actually Googled that. I said, hey, you know what, what, are, what are the DevOps pillars for success? Um, and when I typed that, it came back with, you know what? Google thinks it's between three and nine pillars. That is roughly what I figured out. You know, there nobody really knows, but it seems to be between three and nine. So I actually did a little bit more digging into these pillars. Um, and, and one of, of um, these pillars I found very, very interesting. It started with comms, uh, culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. A little bit after that, um, it was transformed into comms with lean in there. Um, I'll leave lean um, out of this conversation because I think everything needs to be lean. But I found it very interesting and it really matches with what I see in organizations um, if where, where um, this whole movement from waterfall to DevOps where it really worked out, I think they did a really good job uh, towards culture, towards automating a lot, towards measure, measuring the right thing and towards smart sharing. So when I looked at the pillars, when I looked at a lot of pillars, I thought, well, that's, that's quite interesting. And then my second question was like, gee, how would security fit in there? Like how, how can security fit into the culture, into the automation, into the measurement, into the sharing? Um, and interestingly enough, another thing that I figured out was um, with DevOps, yes, you first need, need to make sure that you level out Dev and Ops before you can put security into the mix. So, so don't get me wrong. First, make sure that your DevOps thing is really working um, because if you're going to throw security on top of that without having to without having leveled out the development and the, and, and the operations side, if they are not in sync, it don't start with security you know don't throw security into the mix make sure that you first figure that out before you throw security into the mix but if you throw security into the mix i think from a secure from a, from a cultural perspective um it is everybody's job um i think it does not make sense to always blame the developers for faulty code all too often we hear, you know, it's the developer's fault. Um, it's like building a house. You know, if you build a house and at the end of the day, you know, you want to have your house and you put a lot of pressure on the people, like build it, build it faster, faster, faster. And at the end of the day, if the entire electricity system is, is the wiring is just faulty, well, you know, you can almost start from scratch. Or if you do not put a burglar system in there, well, um, you have to rip out the walls again to try and, and make it uh, uh, work. So, 
you have to give people the time to think about, hey, how are we really going to do this? Like, how are we going to make a secure system? Or in this case, you know, how are we going to make sure that every person comes in at the right time and does the right thing? So it, it, it takes some strategy and strategizing um, in that particular project to make it work. So from a software development perspective, it is the exact same thing. Um, developers need to be given the time to think about and to educate and learn and train themselves in, in how to write secure code. It does not make sense to say, hey, you know what, by the end of the month, that, that, that piece of software needs to be done and not giving any time to, to, to bring them up to speed on how to produce that in a secure way. So don't blame the developers, I would say. First of all, have a look if, if there was sufficient time being given to developers to educate and to upskill themselves. That doesn't mean, you know, that, that developers are, are free game. You know, they, the developers, um, they also have to chip in and, and they also have to understand that, you know, the only code that can be written in an organization is secure code. Okay. So if they are given the time, well, then it's, it's just trying to figure out how can we make the developers interested in security. Um, and I think we have to make sure that, that we match um, his thinking. You know, developers are very creative. They like games um, or, or it needs to be gamified. Um, uh, they like to do stuff hands-on. It has to be always accessible. So there's a lot of these parameters there of, of what a developer expects from, um, uh, uh, you know, on how to produce secure code. At the same time, the developer has to see the benefits. You know, um, he shouldn't uh, one day wake up and say, you know what, I want to learn about security. I have no idea why, but I want to learn about security. No, like he has to see the benefit of producing secure code, you know. Um, and, and ways to do that is, for example, if you make sure in your organization that um, developers with security knowledge um, can do very interesting um, coding projects. Like if you need to work on something that has to be super secure, well, maybe you have to pick the developers um, that are thinking in a particular way, that are thinking about producing secure codes. Um, they have to understand that they are highly sought after developers. And they're actually a good reason. You know, when you're a developer and you start developing code, you make mistakes like what's a semi semicolon and oh, I forgot the semicolon. So you make um, syntactical uh, mistakes. Once you're um, uh, once you go, once you're above that hurdle, you know, then you think about algorithms like, hey, how can I make an algorithm? Once you make an algorithm, you think about, well, how can I design a system that works together? And that's only once you're really a senior developer that you realize like, oh my God, people can misuse my code? Oh, that's quite interesting. Oh, there's stuff like software security. What is software security? Ooh, interesting. So, um, I definitely see a correlation between a security savvy developer and a good developer, and that's absolutely normal. So if, if, if you can bring that across to your developers and they understand that, well, they should be more interested in, in learning about um, producing secure code because, you know, if that's associated with a good developer, well, they should have an interest in that. Last but not least, well, from a cultural perspective, um, very interesting, I think, with Corona, too. I think we, we are really moving on um, from boring schools, from uh, in-person classes. I think there's going to be more and more interesting new tech that, that will surface um, on how we are going to educate people. Um, and I think that is a really, really good movement. If I look at my own kids, this is even a slide from two years ago. If I look at my own kids... Um, they hate French in school. They love French on Duolingo. Why? You know, it's obvious um, why. But, you know, it's interesting that the school system has not moved on and adopted new ways of learning. Automation. Automation is big in, in DevOps. Um, they, we, we try to take the human as much as possible um, out of the loop. Um, we try to avoid human error, and we do that by putting automation in there. Um, first of all, in automation for security, I would say take tools that make sense for you. Take tools um, that fit the technology and the tech stack and the company culture. All too often, I see one group deciding 
on a technology and using that where it does not make sense at all for another uh, group in the organization. Well, they say, you know what? It works for Java and the other, this other group is using JavaScript. Eh, kind of the same. Let's take that tool. No, that's not, that's not how it works, right? So you really need to take tools and, and, and take something that works across the organization if you're going to put it in, in, in the automated tests. Coffee test, uh, one that I really like is um, if a developer goes for a coffee and he presses, you know what, build this thing, by the time he comes back, he should have very valuable input. Um, so it should either break from a security perspective or pass, you know. So you should try to cram as many tests as possible under in, in, in like five minutes or if it's 10 minutes, whatever your coffee break is. Um, and if it doesn't fit in that five minute, you either have to parallelize or um, put things into a nightly build. Maybe a counterintuitive one for automation and security is um, don't block the build, do not block the release. Um, very counterintuitive because we're always used from a security perspective to stop um, and break. Um, and quite often afterwards we say, ah, we're wrong, sorry. Uh, we should not have broken the build here. Um, so it, only if you're 100% confident, you should still block it and you still should still break the build, but only if you're 100% confident. And there's not a whole lot of cases where you're 100% confident. Developers and how they communicate with each other. If I send an email to um, some of my top developers in Secure Code Warrior, I guarantee you that I will not have an answer in the next week. Um, if I ping them on Slack, um, within minutes, I have an answer. So developers no longer read email. I'm sorry. You, we have to, from a security perspective, integrate with how they communicate and not the other way around. So we have to find out ways um, to work with them and not the other way around. Last but not least, if we depend a lot on automation, well, um, especially from a security perspective, make sure there's like no dependencies that everything runs in a, in a standalone container. There's a very simple reason why, because if our stuff goes down, you know, if, if we're stopping and breaking, they all going to point to security and they are, they do not yet, uh, they, they know they do not like security that much. So, um, we have to try and get the developers on our side. So try to do everything you can to not stop them and not break them. I'll skip lean, I'll go to measurement. Um, measuring is a very interesting one. So in DevOps, we're trying to measure um, uh, as much as we can, but we have to think really hard about what we're measuring, especially from a security perspective, because it's all too easy to measure the wrong thing. Um, like measuring the number of problems that you can find. Um, that, is, that is the wrong thing because it gives an incentive to just find problems. It's, it does not give an incentive to fix problems. It gives an incentive to find problems. That, and that does not help to the end goal. The end goal of an organization is to produce secure code, to ship features with confidence. That is the end goal of an organization. Finding problems, a lot of problems, cannot be the end goal. So from a security perspective, we have to think about um, you know, how can we help this entire organization succeed? Okay. And not, you know, not, not trying to measure things that are not really helping at all. And in DevOps, there's a lot of things that you can measure like deployment frequency, change volume, deployment time, and so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of good things where um, security can help. Um, so it can help and think about, hey, how can security help with the deployment frequency? How can we make sure that we're not blocking uh, that like if they're at a particular frequency that we help them and um, um, make sure that they even go faster, if that's possible. Um, there's things that we do not want to measure and definitely do not want to put an emphasis on. Like, for example, mean time to failure. It means, hey, what is the time between two failures? And if we're trying to optimize that, we're trying to figure out like, hey, how can we lengthen the, the time between two failures. And what happens at that time, if you're, if you're trying to do that, is you're hiding problems, you're hiding failures. So this is the wrong thing to do. What you really should do is fail fast and measure how fast you can recover. That is contributing to the end goal, 
which is shipping code with confidence, okay? So don't try to lengthen the time in between two failures. Try to fail fast and make sure you're up and running fast after a failure. That is a good thing to measure. Last but not least, sharing. Sharing information. I already alluded to that one. Um, the days of an AppSec person just giving stacks of paper to developers and asking them to fix the problems these days are over. Um, sharing documents is, is not going to make the cut in the next five years. Um, sharing needs to be done smarter, and especially from a security perspective. Um, let's have a look at what we're doing today, um, or maybe what we're not doing today, but should be doing. If we find a problem, we're going to log that problem in our bug tracking system. A developer will take that problem. He's going to find a fix for that problem. And this is the thing that we're not doing today is sharing. Because what we're doing today is we're fixing that problem. And we're checking that in. And we're closing the bug. And you know where that information is going? It's going into a black hole. Nobody knows how that particular problem was fixed. Um, we are not warning other people like, hey, if you encounter something like that, this is how you can fix it. Or we do not even proactively tell people, hey, you know what? We found this once. Let's never do that again. And this is how you actually produce secure code without introducing that problem. So sharing is very, very important. And I'm not talking about, hey, let's write a document and ship that document to all your colleagues around you. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about technology that captures information, technology that captures the bad code and the good code, and that actually is rolled out to all your fellow developers where they say, hey, you know what? This particular problem has happened before. Um, this is how you should do it. This is the wrong thing, and this is how you should do it. So you should share through technology, like integrate with, with the CICD, into the IDE, wherever. But share through technology. Do not share by writing endless uh, pages of documents. All right. I hope I was able in this presentation to show you why we're still talking about problems like SQL injection. Um, why this problem, which is 22 years old, which is still a top problem in, um, uh, in, in the world, is not fixed today. And, and why it is not fixed today. And, and why a software security person is not able to get that out of, of his way, you know, um, what he's doing on a day-to-day -day basis and what he should be doing on, to the, on a day-to-day -day basis. I also hope I was able to tell you how we can actually embed software security or application security into the culture, the automation, the measurement, and the sharing. So once your organization um, is embracing DevOps, well, here are some things that you can do to actually move security into the culture, into the automation, into the measurement, and into the sharing. I really hope you got something out of this presentation. My name is Matthias Madu, and thank you very much.